The takeaway here is that co-moving coordinates do not change as the universe expands unless the distant objects have their own proper space motions. We know that the universe has whole different kinds of things in it that are really not homogeneous or isotropic. From planetary size scales all the way up to galactic size scales, we can easily note clumpy things that look really different in different directions. So it begs the question, on what size scale does the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric apply? Another way of asking the same question is to say, at what size scales do all other forces concede to the strength of the expansion of space-time? Planets, people, and small things are held together by electromagnetic and gravitational forces that are far stronger than space-time expansion's effect. Large objects are bound together by gravity, and by large, we mean galaxies and on up to the size scales of superclusters of galaxies. Things about 200 megaparsecs in size are the largest possible gravitationally bound structures. When talking about cosmology, we have a sample size box of about roughly 10 billion light years on a side. We find that in such boxes, no matter where they're centered on, whether they're centered on a galaxy cluster or a cosmic void, the average density of each of these boxes is nearly identical. The average density is about one proton's worth of total energy per cubic meter of space. And this is not what we see locally, where you can have differences in densities from cold interstellar space down to the core of a neutron star, and these can differ by a factor of 10 to the 30th. On the largest cosmic size scales that I just described, the density differences are on the order of less than one part in 10,000. As you can see, the largest cosmic size scales are far smoother than the lumpy, lumpy things of planetary and stellar size scales. We have two main ways of measuring the amount of homogeneity in the universe on these large size scales. We can measure how galaxies are distributed across space on scales between, say, a few megaparsecs up to hundreds of megaparsecs, and then we can construct a mass density map of the universe, not just nearby, but at all points throughout cosmic history, because the farther away we look, the farther we look back in time. Second, we can measure the cosmic microwave background, which is the remnant light from the Big Bang, and map the inhomogeneities imprinted on it. The temperature fluctuations observed in this mapping show us the matter distribution of the cosmos. I'll talk about both of these in great detail in later lectures. ESA's Planck mission found that the average density fluctuation in the early universe was roughly the same on all cosmic size scales, about one part in 30,000. To support this, the galaxy distribution observations found a value that's entirely consistent with these CMB measurements. The resultant galaxy structure evolution models and simulations are in total agreement with the CMB and theoretical predictions. We can therefore be really confident in the metric which describes a universe that's roughly homogeneous and isotropic everywhere, with only small, quantifiable imperfections superimposed on top of this uniform background. The smooth beginning that occurred as part of the inflationary epoch was then littered with this clumpy and clustery universe we see today. But even with all this, it is sufficiently uniform on cosmological size scales to justify using a metric that assumes perfect homogeneity and isotropy.